In the mist-shrouded annals of history, an enigmatic saga unfolds. The tale of the Merovingian Franks, a people destined to carve a kingdom from the chaos of a crumbling Roman Empire. Chapter 1. The Rise of the Merovingians. 455 Yonwaven. In the twilight of the Roman Empire, as the sun set on ancient authority, a new force emerged from the Germanic heartlands. The Merovingians, founded by the semi-mythical Merovec, whose lineage was said to be both divine and monstrous, the dynasty began its ascent. The stage was set in the shadowy forests and rolling rivers of Gaul, where the Merovingians would forger their kingdom. The tale truly unfolds with Clovis E, a king of Salian Franks, ascending to power in 401, his name would forever be etched in the annals of history. Clovis, a ruler of remarkable ambition and cunning, vanquished the Roman governor Siagrius at Soissons in 486. His marriage to the Burgundian princess Clotilde in 493, and subsequent conversion to Christianity in 496 after the Battle of Tolbiac, where he famously exclaimed, Christ, thou hast given us victory, marked a pivotal moment. He crafted an alliance with the Roman Church, intertwining Frankish might with Christian piety. By his death in 511, Clovis had expanded his dominion, subduing the Alemanni, Burgundians, and Visigoths. His kingdom, a tapestry of Roman, Germanic, and Christian threads, was divided among his four sons, Thuderic, Clodomer, Childebert, and Clotaire, setting the stage for an era of fraternal rivalry and expansion. Chapter 2. The Merovingian Zenith. 511-656. The sons and grandsons of Clovis continued the expansion of the Merovingian realm. Thuderic I extended his influence into Thuringia and Bavaria. The fierce Clodomer warred against the Burgundians. Meanwhile, Childebert and Clotaire, in a brotherly alliance, seized Burgundy and Aquitaine, their reigns echoing with the clash of swords and the whispers of intrigue. The Merovingian kingdom, at its zenith, was a realm of contrasts, a fusion of Roman law, Germanic customs, and Christian ideals. The famed Edict of Paris, 614, under King Schlothar the Messen exemplified this, asserting royal authority while respecting Gallo-Roman institutions. Dagobert the Mur, ruling until 639, is often remembered as the last powerful Merovingian king, under whom the kingdom experienced a renaissance of arts and culture. His reign, marked by the saying, in his time, the kingdom was peaceful, saw the strengthening of royal power and economic prosperity. Yet beneath this golden veneer, the seeds of decline were sown. The kings began to lose grip on their realm, increasingly controlled by the palace mayors, powerful nobles who would be the undoing of Merovingian supremacy. Chapter 3. The Waning of the Merovingians and the Carolingian Ascendancy, 656-751. As the 7th century waned, the Merovingian kings, dubbed Do-Nothing Kings, became mere figureheads. The true power lay with the mayors of the palace, among whom the Carolingian family rose preeminent. Charles Martel, a name that resounded through history as the victor of the Battle of Tours in 732, halted the advance of the Umayyad Caliphate into Western Europe. His son, Pippin the Short, would be the architect of the dynasty's demise. In a bold move, Pippin sought the Pope's approval to become king, arguing, who should be king but he who holds the power? In 751, with papal endorsement, Pippin deposed the last Merovingian king, Childeric III, cutting his hair to symbolize the end of his royal status and confining him to a monastery. Thus, the curtain fell on the Merovingian dynasty. Their legacy, a blend of myth and might, of sea monsters and sacred kingship, slowly receded into the mists of time, supplanted by the Carolingian dynasty, which would usher in an era of unparalleled revival in what was to become known as the Carolingian Renaissance. 